What's going on everybody? Josh here with Scrapyard Films and today I got another Vegas Pro tutorial for you. And in this one, I'm gonna be teaching you how to get the best render settings for any video whatsoever using Vcoder to render your video inside Vegas Pro 20. To start this off, you wanna download Vcoder and you can do that by going over to vcoder.org and then clicking the download button at the top. In this area, you'll see an app and a connector and you'll wanna download the latest version of the app and then you want to download the connector that applies to your software. So we're going to be using Vegas Pro, the last one, which says the minimum version is 18. This one will work on 20. Once you've downloaded them, install Vcoder, the app first, and then install the connector second. Now let's go ahead and load up Vegas 20. All right, so we're inside Vegas Pro 20 right here. Now, if you already had Vcoder installed because you owned previous versions of Vegas 18, 19, and some other videos, then you should see Vcoder in File Render. So I'm just going to drag and drop something right here and go to File, Render As, but we're not seeing it right here. And there's an easy fix for that. So just go to your File Explorer and navigate to C, Program Files Vegas, where all of Vegas's are installed. And if we go to Vegas 19, then if we go scroll all the way to the bottom, we see Vcoder X64 Config File. Select that, hit Control C to copy, go back and go into Vegas 20, right click and just paste it in this folder. Hit Continue to approve it for admin reasons. And then let's go back to Vegas and go back to 19, go into File I.O. Plugins, and then scroll all the way to the bottom again, see Vcoder Plug folder, select it, Control C to copy, go back to Vegas' destination, go to 20, go to File I.O., right click and paste that folder in here. Once you've pasted these things, go ahead and restart Vegas 20. And so now that we loaded Vegas 20 back up, let's go ahead and drag and drop anything down here, go to File, Render As, and then we see Vcoder right here. Now I have a few presets already saved, but we're gonna go ahead and start some default right up here. And now we see that there's a few options that we have. We have video project default with audio, 4208-bit, with no audio, 4208-bit, 42010-bit with audio, 42010-bit without audio, and 44410-bit alpha channel with audio and 44410-bit alpha channel without audio. Now these numbers are you know, a little bit confusing to the average person, but essentially these first batch of numbers right here is the chroma subsampling, which basically is color crispness and sharpness. And then these bits right here, 8-bit means that it's rendering in up to a few million different colors. 10-bit means it can render in over a billion different colors. So typically these lower ones right here are meant for very high end and very big file sizes if you shot on expensive cameras. And these upper ones right here are meant for like video game footage, stuff you've screen recorded, stuff you shot on your cell phone, things like that. So we're gonna go ahead and select the top one and then hit customize template. From here, we're gonna hit show vocoder dialog and that's gonna launch vocoder the software. So we have some options to look at right here. We have the video option, audio, output settings, and about, and then inside each of these we'll have different tabs. So we're gonna start with the video option right here, and then we're under the encoder tab. And the first option we have is to choose your codec. If we drop that down, we'll see a bunch of different codecs. Now you really don't need to know most of these because a lot of them are fairly old and some of them are new though. Uh, AV1 is the most up and coming encoder that is trying to compete with HEVC because HEVC is not royalty free. They're trying to make AV1 royalty free. So you most likely won't be using AV1 yet unless you're one of those early adopters and wanting to try experimental things. If you want to use GoPro's Cineform HD codec from shooting, let's say, GoPro footage, that's one of the best ones to use for those action cams. Then we have the H.264 codec, which is one of the original ones. If you have a graphics card installed, you're going to see a second option above the X.264 version with either an AMD or NVIDIA option right here. I have an RTX 3080 installed, so it has an NVIDIA encoding chip inside of it, which allows for faster rendering. AMDs also have their own encoder chip inside there. So if you see this option, just know that it's gonna utilize your GPU to render faster. And typically that's one of the best options to choose. Unless you wanted to wait and use the X264 option, that's gonna use your processor to render and it's gonna be a little bit slower. Then if we go down, we see HEVC, which also has the processor and the graphics card rendering assistance options. HEVC will provide you good quality and a lower file size, but the biggest downside to HEVC is that it's a nightmare to edit with. It is horribly optimized to edit footage on compared to H.264 or ProRes. So if you wanna save some space, retain quality, and not edit it anymore, then you can choose HEVC. Then we could skip a couple and go down to the other important one, which is ProRes. 
ProRes is basically the DSLR standard for movie making and recording codecs. So if you have a DSLR that shoots in ProRes or an Atom OS Ninja, something like that that records in ProRes, you're getting pristine, high quality video. And if you wanted to render out in that, you can render out in ProRes here. ProRes is notoriously easier to edit with compared to HEVC and sometimes even better than H.264. But the downsides to ProRes are that the file sizes are humongous because the quality is huge. So choose whichever one applies to you and how you're recording and the videos you're recording. I'm going to go ahead and choose H.264 NVENC because that's going to be the most commonly used one. So I'm going to select it. And by default, it has only one preset. So you can leave it on default and change the options according to however you want. But a lot of these you will never even have to touch. But if you go to the encoder and choose good quality and then hit apply, you're going to see that it changed a couple of these options up here for you. So going over to the options tab, up at the top we have a hardware. It's choosing our graphics card. If you have multiple graphics cards, they will show up on this list. Bit depth, we can choose this and choose between 420 chroma subsampling or 444 chroma subsampling. 444 is going to be a much bigger file size and visually you really won't need to change this unless you're using some sort of high-end DSLR. So we're going to keep it on 420. Standard preset right down here, we select this drop down. This is the speed of your encoder. If you encode it on the fastest, it's going to have lower quality. And if you encode it on the slowest, it's going to have better quality. Typically, I like to keep mine on slow or slower. Profile, we drop this down. These are the different compression methods for the chroma subsampling, and typically you won't really see much of a difference on any of these. But generally, I like to keep mine on high because that usually provides the best results when people are watching it on computers. For strategy, we have a few options as well. We have constant quantizer, constant bitrate, and variable bitrate. These two are the most average ones you that you see, but when it comes to constant quantizer, instead of it going by a bitrate that you're defining, you're going by a scale right here where it says the minimum of the scale is zero and the max is 51. From zero to 51, zero being the absolute best lossless quality and 51 being the absolute worst and lowest quality. The lower number you have, the better quality and the bigger file size. And the bigger number you have, the lower quality and smaller file size. So by default, the average is 23, which is a fantastic number to be on. But typically, I like to keep mine at 15 to 20. Anything lower than that, I don't see a difference in quality, but the file size dramatically starts getting bigger. So 15 is the sweet spot for me. But if you need to save some space, definitely go for 20. Now all these options down here, you can hover across them and read what they do, but typically you will never have to change any of them because they're all set to the proper defaults to provide you the best results. Over in the side data tab, we can actually change a few of these things as well. But again, these are very proprietary and if we start messing with them, you could actually get some worse results because they're automatically set to the default for the best results for you. Over in filters, we can add and edit filters if we want it as well. But again, proprietary, you definitely don't need to do that unless it's something very specific that you're going for. I'm telling you, Vicoder makes it extremely easy for you. So next, let's go to the audio option. And then we have the encoder tab for audio. And if you drop this down, we see a bunch of different audio codecs. By default and the most common, we have AAC. But if you needed something specific for whatever kind of deployment you're going for, if your editor or if your publisher needed something specific right here, you can choose one of these other codecs. But we're going to leave it on AAC. If we go to options, then we see only a couple little options right here. We have bit rate, which 320 kilobits per second is a fantastic bit rate. A lot of audio CDs use that bit rate. But if we drop this down, we see we have a couple more options that are a little bit higher. I've found that if I use 512 kilobits per second compared to 320, I actually get noticeably better audio. So I like to keep my audio at 512. It doesn't really increase the file size too much noticeably at all. So that's why I like to change it to 512. If we go to profile, we can see this controls the properties such as compression algorithm and complexity. If we drop this down, low complexity by default is selected and it is one of the best options. You can choose any of these other ones if you wanted to see how it sounds for you. But by default, low complexity is going to provide you awesome results. Filters again, we can add specific filters if we wanted, but we don't need to do that. Go over to the output tab on the left, and we only have one tab, and this is your muxer and format, so the container that your video is going to be in. So .mp4, mkv, mov, or avi. The most common and compatible video container is mp4. Then the next most common one is avi. Third most common is mov. And then the least common is mkv. 
Now, each of these have their own special real use cases. MP4 is the generally the most compatible, but doesn't allow for any kind of transparency like AVI does. AVI, you can have a transparent video or an alpha channel. MOV can allow you to use certain codecs like ProRes. And MKV has its own special properties that allow for multiple audio tracks and things like that. So typically for Vocoder, I'm gonna be using MP4. Then we have the enable fast start checkbox. If you check this, it's gonna write the metadata first and that's all it's gonna be doing. It really doesn't make any difference when it comes to rendering speed. Then we have settings over here. We can change the language, logging, and things like that. And then if we go to about, we can see all the details of the version, creators, patrons, and things like that. I highly suggest donating to these guys or at least thanking them because this is an amazing renderer that has made a game-changing way of rendering inside of Vegas. So once you're happy with all your settings, go ahead and hit okay. And now before you do anything else, rename it. I like to actually put the details of what I've made in there. So we got NVENC 8-bit 420 CQP 15, something along those lines, just so you can know, and then hit the little floppy disk, hit okay. And then it's gonna show up on your options. You can check the little star next to it to favorite it. So if you wanted to filter out to your favorites, you can easily find what your favorite ones are. And those are generally the best render settings that the average person will have a great result in video if they render out using those. Now, just in case you don't have an NVIDIA graphics card and the AMD options look a little bit different, I'm gonna go ahead and do another option, but show you with the processor itself. So we click our first option, go to customize template, show the coder dialog. Then we're gonna keep it on H.264 and not choose a graphics card for a renderer. And we see that we have a few different presets right here. The people of Vakoda were nice enough to give us some parentheses of what each of these options are generally used for. And we can see this first one, 420 Chroma subsampling 8-bit is recommended if you just don't know really what's going on. 420 10-bit is also recommended if you wanna have a higher bit depth. 444 8-bit is if you wanna render it and reuse that footage and not have any kind of loss in quality. 44410 bit is used for if you want to render something in the same codec and quality as you captured it, which is usually the absolute highest. So going from 4208 bit to 44410 bit, your file size is going to be small to humongous, but the quality is going to be shifted from good quality all the way to amazing quality. Then they have the lossless formats here and the high compression versions right here. So if you wanted great quality, but lower file size, it takes a long time, but it'll render it for you. And then lossless, it will be great looking quality, but the absolute biggest file sizes you've ever seen. So if we go up to options, we can see none of these are changed. They're all default, right? But if we go back to encoder and choose, let's just say the first one and hit apply for the preset, hit okay. Then we go over to our options and we can see a lot of these have been custom changed by the developers to give you the absolute best results. And it looks amazing. One difference between using the processor and using the graphics card is the strategy right here. If you go to the strategy and drop down this menu, you see average bit rate, you see constant rate factor, and then constant quantizer. This one was the one that they only had the option for using the graphics card. But if you use the processor, it unlocks this one called constant rate factor, which is just about the exact same thing. It has a scale that goes from zero to 51, just like CQP. And again, the stance has stayed the same. 15 is what I use on average. 20 is what I want to use if I want to save a little bit of file size. And I know I'm not going to be reusing it or bringing it back into a project to edit it some more. One last thing is the pixel format. If you drop that down, you have a few more options when compared to NVENC. We have 420 Chroma subsampling, 422 and 444. And we also have 10 bit versions of 420, 422 and 444. 420, good for screen recordings and video games. 422 and 444 are good for high-end DSLR and camera footage. Use 10-bit if your camera is even higher end and uses 10-bit when it's recording its original footage. All of my videos that I render are using Vocoder and using these awesome settings. So all the DSLR intro footage and outro footage I have, along with all of the screen recorded footage, all of them are rendered with Vocoder. Once you're happy with these settings, go over to audio, go to options, change that down to 512, Go to your output, go to your container, and choose the one that applies to you. I'm going to stick with MP4. After you like your settings, hit OK. Change this again to the details of it. And then hit Save. Hit OK. And then we see our option right here. And if this video helped you out, be sure to shoot a like and subscribe down there, because that'll really help me out. I'll see you guys in the next video.